So, I wonder if people know what today, what uh, talk uh, we're going to have today. What is the talk on today? I think most people know that I've been talking about uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. Yes. Yes, indeed. I've got, got it right. It's the last talk. It had, has to be fitted in, doesn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, it's left unfinished. And a very important part of the path is uh, right samadhi or um, right stillness, sometimes called concentration, right concentration. But like uh, Ajahn Brahm, who's my teacher, I shy away from that translation of uh, concentration because it sounds far, far too forceful far, far too much driven by will, what I want to do, I'm going to get this, I'm going to make it happen, I am getting, going to make the mind one-pointed. And of course this is not the way the mind works, <laughs> nor the path for that matter. So coming from a sense of self is always going to lead, lead to quite a few problems for us in practicing the spiritual life, but also in our everyday life. So, usually I like to start with a, uh, uh, a quotation, um, like uh, some poetic verses usually from uh, the Buddha about the Noble Eightfold Path, just to give, give the context of the talk. And this is quite a lengthy one, but it's, it's a one that I mentioned last uh, time I spoke on Samasati, that's right mindfulness, I mentioned one of the verses from that. And this is a teaching the Buddha gave uh, when he, he was asked by um, uh, Venerable Ananda, <coughs> saw a layman uh, coming out of Savati driving this splendid white um, chariot. Not only that, he had white horses. He was wearing white. Everything was white. And uh, Venerable Ananda thought, oh, this is a, a very impressive um, vehicle, a divine vehicle, he thought. It looks like something that a dev or a divine being might drive in. It was actually Janasoni the Brahmin, who was obviously color coordinated, and uh, he. Uh, so he asked the Buddha, "Is uh, is there any divine vehicle in the Buddha's teaching?" Which is an interesting concept. The Buddha is very flexible because <laughs> he replied, "Yes, there is," and he said to him, uh, he talks about this, and then he says to Venerable Ananda, and this is very important because it shows what the Noble Eightfold Path is for too. He said, right view, this is the first fact of the Noble Eightfold Path, Ananda, when developed and cultivated, has as, it, has as its final goal the removal of lust, this is like greed, getting, wanting, the removal of hatred, the removal, removal of delusion. And each factor of the Noble Eightfold Path removes those. So we have right, uh, after this we have right motivation or right, right attitude, I like, right action, right speech, right action, right livelihood, we could say right work, and also we have uh, after that right effort and we have right mindfulness and then right stillness or right samadhi. And then the Buddha said, in this way, Ananda, it may be understood how this is a designation for the Noble Eightfold Path, the divine vehicle and the vehicle of Dhamma and the unsurpassed vehicle in battle, victory in battle, the unsurpassed victory in battle. And this is what the Blessed One said. Having said that, having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, this is the Buddha, further said, this is talking about the Noble Eightfold Path or the, this divine vehicle as, uh, as he's referring to it. Its qualities of faith and wisdom are always yoked evenly together. Shame, oh, this is a heriotype, like a sense of conscience, is its pole. Mind is its yoke tie. Mindfulness, the watchful charioteer. The chariot's ornament is virtue. Its axle, this is where the, the energy is coming from in a way, jhana, energy is, is its wheels. Equanimity keeps the burden balanced in the chariot. Desire, desirelessness serves as upholstery. Goodwill, harmlessness and seclusion. These are the chariot's weaponry. Interesting. Forbearance, this is patience or kanti, its armour and shield and it rolls towards security from bondage. This is Nirvana or Nibbana. This divine vehicle, unsurpassed, originates from within oneself. The wise depart from the world in it, inevitably winning the, the victory. So that's a very nice, uh, very 
very nice sort of uh, uh, summary of the qualities of the Noble Eightfold Path. And of course, it includes things that we that are not factors actually, like faith is is not necessarily mentioned directly, but it, mindfulness for certain. And of course, for today's talk, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, sama, samadhi, right stillness, and of course, jhana is 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 the essence of that, and that's the axle of this chariot. So he's looking at this vehicle and seeing all the qualities of the noble eightfold path in this vehicle and describing in terms of those uh, the parts of the chariot. And Buddha did this, he often used things that were very common in their day that people would uh, know about and could relate to. So he used these uh, similes that were very, very relevant to them. And I think if he were here today, he would probably use similes about cars, but how many people know all about their cars, I don't know. <laughs> so. So all the, uh, the important thing, as I mentioned before, as people often think when they uh, hear about the Noble Eightfold Path, right view and so on, is how come it's right? What's, does, uh, what does this mean? Is this, you know, because most people think of right and wrong, very relative thing. But of course, as I've said uh, on every occasion before, is that right is right for enlightenment, for reaching that goal. There are many other types of views. There are very, many, many other types of uh, of uh, motivation, many other types of uh, attitude, uh, speech, action, work, uh, effort, uh, mindfulness and stillness that will reach other goals. But this goal that the Buddha is talking about, these are right for, the, that the Buddha is describing, are right for awakening, right for enlightenment. And of course the very this uh, this uh, uh, samadhi is part of the last sama samadhi right stillness is part of the last section of the noble eightfold path which is usually called the samadhi section and of course it really points to a sequence doesn't it that you have to have right effort right effort is to uh, avoid or abandon uh, negative states of mind develop positive or wholesome states of mind and maintain them. So we overcome the negative states of mind we have when we sit down to meditate for instance. Then we develop mindfulness. Often they say we establish mindfulness in front of us which means uh, making a prior priority, making it the foremost thing in our mind. And then samadhi develops from that, the stillness develops from the mindfulness. And of course the interesting thing, you know, often people think mindfulness and samadhi are different things and you'll hear some, some teachers who will say, you know, emphasize one or the other. But as I mentioned uh, when I was talking about uh, right mindfulness, the peak of mindfulness, this is sati, peak of sati, where is it? It's the fourth jhana, this happens in the fourth jhana. So you can see that they're actually, uh, sati and samadhi are just different uh, stages of the development of mindfulness and that mindfulness reaches its uh, peak in fourth jhana. So very, very, uh, it's good to see that actually get the context because people sometimes confused and there are many teachings that emphasize one or the other. And of course I say to people, we must go back to the teachings of the Buddha because then you can check up and then you can look, you can see what I'm saying, is this according to the Buddha's word? Or another teacher saying, is this according to the Buddha's word? And of course, uh, if you do look at the Buddha's teaching, one of the very striking things about, especially in terms of sama samadhi, uh, right uh, stillness or right steadiness of mind, is that it occurs everywhere. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And the Buddha, and I'll read out some other quotations that make it very obvious that the Buddha put a lot of emphasis on it as a uh, means to awakening, as a means uh, to developing the steadiness, the depth, the power, the penetration we need in order to develop insight. So this is, and I feel I'm very fortunate because I, most, many of my teachers actually emphasized uh, teaching samadhi and of course, uh, you know, Ajahn Brahm, of course he teaches samadhi quite a bit and emphasizes jhana. And uh, same with um, one of my earlier teachers, Ayakema. She taught jhana and emphasized samadhi and was very good at it too and very good, very uh, well uh, developed in that. And of course, many of you know Bhante Gunaratana, 
I think most, most people have heard of him, Bhante Ji as they call him, who lives in the US. And he, he teaches jhana as well, you know, teaches this. And these days, uh, after a very, very long time, you know, jhana and the samadhi practice is returning as a, as a practice that uh, people will develop, are developing and very, very useful. In fact, one of the, uh, I didn't get the quote for it, but uh, in the numerical discourses, the Buddha said one of the future dangers, he said, for the practice he, 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 in these uh, suttas, is a number of them where he talks about five dangers, future dangers that will arise. And one of them is that people will uh, uh, speak in dispraise. They will look down on samadhi. They will they will discount samadhi, and this isn't won't be for their uh, won't be for their wel welfare and development of the path. So, this is a, a future danger. So, the first thing is what is samadhi? I think many people have got an idea now that I'm using stillness, <laughs> not concentration. And the reason that I do that is because, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we cannot use force to make the mind come together. Samadhi is the mind converging, coming together, becoming one-pointed, becoming very steady, very still, just focused on a very, very small area. In fact, you could think of samadhi as being like a focusing of the mind, but it's not a focusing we do. I've had a few people say to me, you know, I've um, been practicing meditation, practicing the breath meditation, anapanasati, and I'm trying to keep focused on the, the nose, uh, the area around the nostrils, and the breath coming in and out. And they said, this person said to me, they get a headache. <laughs> they really got a headache. They thought their head was going to explode. And I thought, wow, this is too much force. Because samadhi and uh, the development of right stillness is a natural quality. We're working with the mind. If we try to force the mind, it will rebel. If you try to force your kids, if you work with people who try to control you, what happens? Nobody likes it. Nobody enjoys it. And the mind is just the same. And of course it will rebel, it will have headaches, it, it will tell you it doesn't want to do this, <laughs> and so on. But what we do with meditation is to work with the mind, create the causes and conditions for these things to happen. And of course this is how we can develop the stillness in the mind, going through the causes and the right causes and conditions to bring it up. And it's very, it's really um, uh, uh, important to notice too that uh, samadhi, this quality of stillness, steadiness in the, in the mind, this ability to focus in, it's like attention really when we say that, isn't it, is, um, is something we all have. You know, it's not something that, that's alien to people. We all use this uh, ability of samadhi to, to a certain extent in our work, in our studies, you know, just to focus on what we're reading, what we're watching on television and so on. There is this ability to hone, to hone in on whatever we are paying attention to. So it is an aspect of our experience and we all have it. And really, most of the Buddha's teachings are about developing qualities we already have, just, just maximizing them, taking them to, to, the, to the limit that we can. So this is a, um, a very important, uh, important aspect of the path. We have it already. and. Also that, as I mentioned before, that this mindfulness that we all have too, people have it, animals have it. You can see it when, uh, you know, uh, animals are, are, uh, are hunting and so on, or people uh, are hunting. You can see they put a lot of attention, and this lot of mindfulness on what they're doing, getting ready to pounce. <laughs> this is not right mindfulness, of course, <laughs> because it's very negative what they're about to do. But what we see is, as I say, that mindfulness, when, when it is sustained, when it is uh, kept in mind, uh, it gets stronger and stronger and becomes stiller and stiller and stiller until it becomes one-pointed. One -pointed. So, so this is actually the relationship between mindfulness and samadhi that they are actually a continuum. They're not different, uh, different beasts, as we say. They're actually parts of the mind, parts of our experience, parts of our faculties that we develop and that they turn into changes that develops into this uh, samadhi, which is very useful 
because it empowers the mind. It gives the mind strength and also it's a very happy state of mind. So this is another important uh, function of samadhi. And just to give an illustration, of course, uh, from Ajahn Brahm's uh, teachings, uh, when he did his first meditation retreat, I can't believe the first meditation retreat this happened, his mind obviously, you know, developing meditation, getting very deep states of peace, the mind becoming very still, steady, and very, very alert. People who think that jhana is like a blank state of mind or, you know, a frozen state of mind uh, couldn't be further from the truth, of course. It's a very aware, a very energized state of mind. And he would... Uh, he was at this meditation retreat in Cambridge and for the lunch break, he, after he'd had his lunch, I think, and he went, he went to the, the botanical gardens. This is a garden, a park in Cambridge. And then he saw this, he walk in the park just to, you know, spend some time there. And he saw this clump of bamboo in the park and he thought, oh, how incredibly beautiful it is, you know, and he, he was mesmerized by it. In fact, he never got any further than the clump of bamboo. And he, he looked and you could see all the shades of the green and, you know, the, all the different textures in, in the bamboo. And he was really amazed by it. He thought it was really extraordinary. He'd never seen bamboo like this. It was the most beautiful bamboo he'd ever seen. And then he'd go back to the meditation retreat. And when the meditation retreat, some weeks later, he thought he would drop back to the park to see this bamboo. And he was shocked. Because when he looked at the bamboo, it was quite an ordinary clump of bamboo, actually. <laughs> it was just very ordinary, not a, not a stunning example of bamboo by any means. And he realised, as we realised, that his mind with that samadhi, with that stillness in it, could see more deeply into what he was observing and could see the beauty. And it, it made this very ordinary clump of bamboo something extraordinary that he could really see so much a detail in and was so beautiful for him. And this is, of course, pointing to what samadhi does for us when we develop it. It has this sense of uh, happiness and beauty, but it, that enables us to go into whatever we're observing, go into it, really see deeply into it. And this is the function of samadhi, isn't it? Really, to give us that ability to penetrate, to be able to stay with, rather than our usual functioning, which is all over the place. We're usually distracted with thinking of this and that and, uh, and, and not getting any depth. So I mean, we can say what is, uh, what is right samadhi is, is very, uh, is, as I've mentioned already really, everywhere in the uh, suttas when the Buddha is asked what is right samadhi when he's talking about the path, what is right stillness or concentration, <laughs> he always says the four jhanas, the four jhanas. There's, I don't think there's hardly anywhere that he gives an alternative to that. So that for him, this is the, uh, uh, the sort of samadhi we should be aiming for. And I'll talk a little bit later about do we need, does everybody need to develop jhana? Is it possible to develop jhana? Which is what is up, up, uppermost in our minds usually. People think, is it possible? You know. So I'll just describe from the Buddha's own words what... Uh, the, um, this is Ajahn Brahm's translation, quite nice because it's very accessible, uh, what, how he describes the jhanas. And so he says, and this is the first jhana, having abandoned the five hindrances, these are the negative states of mind that prevent us from uh, becoming still, peaceful, developing wisdom, totally free from the five senses, so they can't hear, smell, taste and touch and all those things, free from unwholesome states, this is the hindrances, you enter and you enter upon and abide in, in the first jhana, wherein the mind moves on to the object, this is vitaka, and holds on to it, vichara, the object being joy and pleasure, caused by being totally free from the five senses. Isn't it amazing? Because we often think that's where happiness is, out there. But the Buddha is saying, actually, happiness is in here, in the mind. And when we actually let go of the five senses, all that, that can, desire connected to hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and so on, where we're used to, actually, we're very much used to the external world. When we let go of it, what's the result? Great happiness, this, uh, the mind coming together, the mind going within itself, finding happiness within itself. And of course, I think everybody knows, uh, they have this uh, intuition at least, 
that happiness, the enjoyment we get from the external world is actually coming from us. If it were not the case, we'd all enjoy the same things. <laughs> if, the, if the happiness was coming from outside to us, into us, then we would all be finding happiness in the same areas, from the same sights, smells, tastes and touches. And this is not the case. And uh, then uh, the, the quotation continues from another sutta where it says, in the first jhana five things are absent and five factors are present. When one has entered the first jhana, the five hindrances, this is called the panchanivarana, are totally absent. And what is present is the mind moves on to the object, this is often called initial application, uh, vitaka, holds on to it, it stays with it. And this is called vichara. And the object being joy and pleasure. This is piti, this joy, this rapture, incredible feeling of energy through the body uh, in many forms. And pleasure, sometimes called happiness. Uh, this is what is the object of the experience. And there is one oneness of mind. It's very easy to see when the Buddha describes it like that. Why is there oneness of mind? because the focus is this joy and happiness. The mind is glued to it. Who wants to go anywhere else? <laughs> when you're, you're, you know, you're having a lot of happiness, the most happiness, the most joy you've ever experienced in your life. Do you want to go anywhere else? Do you, do you think I need something else? Something else is required to make me happy. You found what you're looking for. So therefore, it's very easy for the mind to stay put, for the mind to become one-pointed. In fact, hard to drag it away from it. <laughs> And of course, this is one of the one of the things that comes from samadhi too. Is that in fact, and you learn this, and people will learn this from the experience that the mind will come out of that experience when it's ready, because it's having such a good time. It's so happy, so joyful, so one pointed. It's found what uh, what it's looking for. It, it will come out of it when it's ready, not when it's convenient. And I'll t <laughs> I'll tell a, st a little story about that in a minute. Well, maybe now, actually. There is a story of, uh, I heard this from Rajan Brahm, but other people have said it, uh, they've heard it too, they've, or they knew about it. And this is a story about a Vietnamese monk. I don't know who it is, some people may know who it is, who was giving a retreat in, I think, Sydney. It was in, in uh, eastern, uh, the eastern state somewhere. And uh, before the retreat started, I think it was a nine or a ten day retreat, ten days is the usual one, he, before he gave his first talk or introduction, he sat down to meditate and he went, he went into meditation and didn't come out. The, the people came and they were sitting there and it was due to give the talk and, and nothing happened. And uh, then uh, the, the talk, the time for the talk was over, he was still sitting there and time for questions, he was still sitting there, time for bed, still sitting there. The next morning they came back, still sitting there, no breakfast, no talk in the morning. And this went on for, I think it was about seven days, at least seven days. And then he came out of the meditation and he apologised to everybody. He said, I, I only intended to go in for a few minutes actually. <laughs> and he came out seven days later and people said, no, sadhu, sadhu, this is well done, well done. They were so inspired to see someone meditate for, a, totally, for such a long time, not getting up to go to the toilet, not getting up to, to eat or drink for seven days. Fantastic and amazing. And of course, uh, I think many of you would have heard of too, the Buddha boy in Nepal. There was the, on YouTube, there's lots of these uh, videos about him meditating for not, not just a week, for very long periods and, and not, apparently not getting up for eating, drinking, going to the toilet for months, you know, which is extraordinary. So as I say, once the mind is enjoying this experience of inner joy and happiness, it doesn't want to go anywhere else and it may not wish to come out at a convenient time for the, according to the schedule. And then of course the Buddha goes on for the second jhana and this is the uh, development of the first jhana. With the fading away of joy you abide mindful and fully aware. This is important, fully aware. Some people think it's, you know, that jhana is a blank state or whatever or trance. <laughs> Experiencing a bliss purified from uh, purified, experiencing a bliss purified from joy, you it's abandoned. You enter upon and abide in the third. Oh no, sorry, the second jhana we're up to. 
Ah, here we are, back to it. When the mind no longer moves on to the object, we had that, Vitaka, uh, because it lets go of holding on to it, you enter upon and abide in the second jhana, which has trust, or often translated as confidence, uh, in the object, the bliss enough to let go of holding it. This is what Ajahn Brahm's comment is. And unity of mind without any movement or holding with joy and pleasure caused by absolute stillness. And this, the second jhana is likened to uh, a rock-like state of mind, like a diamond-like state of mind. It's not moving anywhere. There's no, no movement to focus on the object. There's no movement to hold on to the object anymore. And there, the, um, the object, the, the joy and happiness is still there in, in that jhana. And it's there not, not so much because you're free of the five senses, it's there because uh, the stillness is so perfect, nothing is disturbing the mind. It's like the, the sign is up on the door, please do not disturb, but it's not possible <laughs> in that state, you know, to disturb it because the five senses are uh, turned off, as it were. So this is a second jhana. So what you're seeing is to a more refined state, moving from first jhana to a more refined state where some of the qualities of the first jhana, that movement onto the object, you know, we call it uh, vitaka, and the movement to hold the object. You can think of it as focusing, and then the focus is established. You can think of it like that. Um, there's none of that in the second jhana. So this is an incredible state of mind. Often you hear too, uh, in the commentaries, I only hear this in the commentaries, but they call it about mundane jhana. Uh, when I hear those combination of words, I think, my goodness, how could you call this mundane? <laughs> this is the most extraordinary state of mind, you know. And the Buddha, of course, he called it Utri Manusa Dhamma. And this means something uh, that's higher, higher than the human, actually. It's actually another realm of experience going to the mind. And so it's a very, very high state of uh, uh, mental experience of meditation. And in fact, for monks and for nuns, if we... If we claim to have jhana and we don't have it, it's a disrobing effect, uh, offense. It's an offense that means that person is no longer a monk or a nun. Similarly, if they claim to be enlightened and they're not, they're no longer a monk or a nun, whether, whether the, anybody knows that or not. So it's, a, it's quite a serious thing. So now we with the, uh, now the third jhana, that's it. Got to keep, keep on track. <laughs> So with the third, you could hear all the four actually. <laughs> with the fading away of joy, you abide mindful. So this is the that joy. Remember joy and happiness, or joy and pleasure. This is piti sukha. That joy is very, to a certain extent, exciting, exhilarating, and not peaceful. So here it fades away, and you abide mindful and fully aware. So this is sati uh, sampajanya, experiencing a bliss purified from joy, so no joy there. You enter upon and abide in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce one has a pleasant abiding indeed, uh, who has such mindfulness and equanimity. So this is third jhana. So what you can see is with the whole experience of the jhanas, more and more th things are dropping away as the time goes on. It's getting more and more subtle, more and more refined more and more peaceful uh, as, t as time goes by, as it develops. And then uh, the fourth jhana, of course, which is the, uh, the height of the jhanas. There are some immaterial jhanas, they're often called, but these are the ones that the Buddha usually refers to when he's talking about uh, right stillness or right uh, uh, concentration. Having abandoned pleasure and pain, and this is uh, uh, the comment is that this is all Vedana, this is all feeling coming from the five senses. Five senses are totally turned off, so that's gone. All the pleasure and pain related to the body, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching, mainly touching when you're meditating, that's gone. And with the disappearance of joy and grief, and this is all the feeling that's uh, coming from mental experience has disappeared, except for one, and that's equanimity. So this, this state is free of joy and grief, the mental, uh, mental uh, pleasure and pain, and physical pleasure and pain. And then the Buddha says, you enter upon and abide in the fourth jhana, which is only neutral 
a mental feeling or vedana remaining. Just pure mindfulness and with equanimity. That's the fourth jhana. And of course, I think many people will know it was from here, from this experience, after this experience of fourth jhana, what happened to the bodhisattva? He wasn't the Buddha then. He became enlightened, yes. He used the power of the fourth jhana to uh, develop his insight into you know, his previous births, into the fact that uh, beings arise and pass away due to their actions of body and speech and mind, and then to destroy the negativity in the mind. So this is, uh, this is what he used for his own enlightenment. And there's a very nice uh, uh, um, sutta where he, he actually says this, um, that he, this is just before he became enlightened. He said, I remembered at a time when my father was occupied, while, this was doing a ploughing festival evidently, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, having passed beyond the five senses, so he wasn't hearing, smelling, tasting or touching, he was going inside the mind, and free from unwholesome states. I entered and abided in the first jhana. This is at 11 years old, not bad. <laughs> I thought, could, and he's thinking later, this is just before he became enlightened. I thought, could that be the path to enlightenment, Bodhi? Then the realization arose that jhana is indeed the path to enlightenment. This is the path to enlightenment. So this is the Buddha's own words, you know, that uh, this is how he attained enlightenment, using jhana and so on. So of course people, um, people often say, well, you know, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll deal with a very common one that because jhana is such a pleasant experience, there's a lot of joy and happiness in the jhana experience, won't you get attached to it? Won't you, uh, won't you uh, as it were, not go beyond it? Won't you, you won't, will you, you will you not, uh, you, is it probably you won't develop uh, um, insight? And of course, it didn't happen for the Buddha. It didn't happen for him, he, the Bodhisattva. He used it and then developed the insight. But so it's very. Uh, this is a common common question: is Is there a danger that one will become attached to samadhi, stillness, and peaceful states? And that's uh, something we commonly hear in the Buddha's time too. There must have been a lot of uh, a lot of this idea around too, because he said, uh, "This is another quote: There are chunda." This is one of his disciples, I think a novice actually. These four kinds of, of life devoted to pleasure that are entirely conducive to turning away disenchantment, to fading away cessation, peace, realization, enlightenment, to nibbana. And what are they? What are they? The four jhanas. <laughs> and he says, so if devotees of other sects should say that the Buddhists are addicted to these four forms of pleasure, pleasure seeking, they should be told, yes, they are addicted, for they would be speaking correctly about you. And then he said, then some people might ask further, and this is a good question, <laughs> ask, ask you, what benefits can you expect from a life attached to these four forms of pleasure seeking? And the Buddha replies, you should reply that you can expect only four fruits, four benefits, stream winning, this is a sotapanna, uh, once returner, this is Sakadagami, non-returner, Anagami, and a full enlightenment. This is Arahant. These are the four, these are the benefits that you can expect from being attached to these four forms of pleasure seeking. So it, it shows us a very, even if we cannot develop the jhanas, it shows us a very important uh, principle that many of us know already, that it's a pleasure principle that leads us on uh, to develop uh, particularly in meditation, it's very important that we have positive, wholesome states of mind that are pleasant, that bring happiness, that bring some joy to us. And that this will be the glue, this will be the, the element that enables us to go deeper and deeper in meditation. It is not from forcing ourselves, not by putting ourselves in a boot camp, as it were, and, and saying, I've got to get serious about this. I want to be enlightened by next Wednesday. That's when my holidays finish. <laughs> I've got to be enlightened by then. I'm going to do it. <laughs> that sort of attitude is is uh, counterproductive and often lead. You notice it will lead to a lot of frustration, disappointment, and sometimes people think, "Ah, oh, it doesn't work. It's no good. I'll give it up." 
So a very important uh, element of the Buddha's teaching, a very important lesson from this is we need to find this, uh, this uh, happiness, this joy, bring it up and use it in the meditation. This is what will bring the mind together. This is where, how the mind will develop st uh, stability, stillness, this samadhi. It's not through our act of will, as much as one would like it. You cannot wish, I'll be in the first jhana like that. You have to know the pathway into it, which is through happiness, through joy. And of course, the Buddha often talked about those, the, 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 the important ingredients in that is that we develop gladness in the mind. And from that, we can get this joy, the piti. And then we can get this, uh, from piti, we get tranquility. Body becomes very relaxed, it all can disappear. And then happiness or this pleasure, sukha, comes up. And then he said, this is a condition for the mind coming together, samadhi. So the whole path of meditation is not a path of force. If we try to force it, uh, as I say, we'll end up with the famous samadhi headaches and <laughs> all these other problems that people get. Sometimes even on the, uh, for instance, the Goenka retreats, I've heard there have been problems with some of the meditators because they've forced their minds. And one of, the, one of the problems there too is that they've not had much experience. So they, you know, it's difficult for them to do, go from zero meditation, zero hours of meditation to 10 hours a day is quite a lot. It's asking a lot. So, and uh, so the, the other thing that people will ask actually is how much samadhi do we need? Because this is another, another thing that people often bring up. You know, do we need to develop jhana to awaken, to become enlightened? How much do we need for developing insight? And of course, you know, very, it depends on what you're aiming at, doesn't it? You know, if we want to develop the meditation, um, you know, any, any degree of stillness will help. And the commentaries, of course, they have, they divided up the uh, um, development of stillness, development of concentration. They have this neighborhood concentration, which is the being on the verge of going into jhana. And this is a state uh, where the hindrances are reduced and, uh, uh, are not active. They're just in the background. They're very close to the surface, unfortunately. So, and then going into jhana. So, for any of us, developing any degree of uh, stillness is useful in our meditation, and using that, as I said, that joy, that happiness, to bring the mind together. You know, the mind will want to uh, come together if it's got that joy and that happiness there. Of course, Ajahn Brahm says, absolutely necessary for enlightenment, <laughs> as you all know, that we have the jhana experiences. And my, my own, of course, we know from the Buddha's teaching, some people in the time of the Buddha, they didn't appear to be in jhana, and they became uh, at least the first age of enlightenment. So some uh, teachers say that maybe the first age of enlightenment you can reach without uh, jhana, without this sama, uh, samadhi. Um, and uh, maybe even the second stage, they say. Nearly everyone will say the third stage of enlightenment, fourth stage of enlightenment. This is uh, um, the non-returner and the fully enlightened, uh, the path to becoming fully enlightened, absolutely need. But, but then, no difficulty because the negative states of mind, gone <laughs> for those people, you know, for the greed, greed and hatred, gone, and delusion almost gone for, for the anagami. So, the, um, these, it's easy for them, but uh, whether one needs it for the, uh, for the first stage of enlightenment, second stage of enlightenment, is open to debate. If one does have it, it will be that much, much easier. Why is that? Because when, we, when, we, uh, when, we, when people experience the jhanas, they're in a very, in a very uh, real way going to a different world. They're experiencing a world. We know the world of the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, don't we? That's what we know. And then they're going to, we're going to a world in the, of the mind, this, this, this world of the mind, which is totally devoid of those things. And yet, there's all this happiness, this bliss, and this uh, wisdom that can come from that. So this is like another world that we're going to. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very good source of insight. You know, because if you go to another place, if you go, say, out of Australia, um, if you go to Paris and you come back to Australia, you know what Paris is about. And also it gives you a different attitude about Australia because you think, oh, wow, 
they do things differently there. They, their bread's different and so on. <laughs> they have all these different croissants or whatever. In the same way, when, we, when uh, people experience jhana, they come back to the experience of this world of five senses. It's a different, different take that they get because they can see that, you know, things that they thought were permanent in, our, in the experience of, of the five senses being here and now disappeared. They weren't there. They were anicca, we say. And also, if you've experienced the greatest happiness, peace and joy that you've ever had in your life, coming back to this world after you've come out of the meditation, what's it going to be like? It's not going to feel great, <laughs> I think, immediately. Immediately, actually, afterwards, the contrast is, is extraordinary. And also, you've also seen the what. What did I let go of? What did I let go of when I went into this state? And, of course, it's this sense of self. is greatly reduced. And the, the whole experience is a, like a unity experience. It's not a me experiencing this. It's just experience. So it's, a, it's loaded with insight, this, uh, you know, this going to this other world. We call it Rupa Loka often. They call it Rupa Loka in the Pali terms. And when we come back, wow, what a contrast. <laughs> How different from what I experience here and now. And so this is very, you know, it's just insight is built into the experience because we have the information, we have the data that we can, we can say, oh, wow, yes, it is. Uh, I can see, you know, these terms that we hear quite often, anicca, dukkha, anatta, uh, which is, you know, impermanence, often called impermanence or not sure, and uh, dukkha, like uh, stress or un, unsatisfactoriness, and anatta, non-self. You can see these things happening in our experience of the meditation. So the next thing, of course, most people say, is it possible? <laughs> to, to uh, develop jhana these days. It reminds me, not so long ago, particularly in Sri Lanka, maybe in Thailand too, people have the attitude it's not possible to become enlightened these days. And that we have to wait until Maitreya Buddha, the next Buddha comes, and then, then we can become enlightened. And of course the Buddha said, when there is a Noble Eightfold Path, then there will be uh, enlightened beings of the first stage, second stage, third stage and fourth stage. So we don't have to wait until the next, uh, the next Buddha. So is it possible for us to develop a jhana these days? And of course, uh, you, you'll hear from Ajahn Brahm and his experience of teaching. He's taught many of these retreats. And he, he always, I think nearly every retreat, there are some people that get jhana. Not everybody. I mean, people want to know how many are getting jhana. <laughs> is it 60%? Is it 70%? I don't think it's that at all. We're looking at a small percent. But even if they don't, jhana, they don't experience their first jhana or second jhana or whatever, you know from your own experience of meditation retreats, I know, come out of it, you can feel that the mind is much more steady, more still, and more, more balanced and more able to look into things. And this, this shows that there is a, the, the stillness, this uh, samadhi is developing. We may not have reached jhana in, in that retreat, but it is, it is something we can benefit from, we can use in our practice, in our life. So I would say from Ajahn Brahm's experience, not my own, I, don't, I haven't had students come up and say, well, I've got jhana, I've got the first jhana, and they tell me, and I think, well, that sounds pretty good. I do hear, I do meet people who can tell me about their experiences because they come and talk about them, and some of them sound very much like they have experienced jhana. And uh, so it is possible uh, for us. And I always liked what I came uh, pointed to, and the Buddha points to it too, that it is a natural process. This is the way the mind will go. It will go within itself. Given the right causes, the right conditions, it goes within. And of course the Buddha, he gave a very nice uh, sutta in the uh, uh, numerical discourses, the Anguttara Nikayas and the Tens, where he traces it right from, from ethical behavior, sila, right through, he says, from ethical behavior you can get this happiness of uh, not non-remorse, you know, that you know what you're doing is good. From that happiness you can d uh, develop this uh, uh, joy, this piti, and then from this you can develop tranquility, uh, tranquility, the peacefulness of the mind and the body, the body particularly, disappearing. And then you can develop happiness, 
and then you can develop the samadhi and then you can develop seeing things as they truly are and then you can develop knowledge and vision of uh, liberation. So he, he took it the whole way and he said this is a natural uh, process. It's natural once we get the right causes and conditions in place. That's, that's the, it will happen by itself as it were. And I often say to people when uh, teaching meditation, our main job for meditation at the beginning of it is to interest the mind in what we're doing, interest the mind in the object of meditation. For samadhi practice we usually use one object uh, to, to bring the mind to focus on. And our job as meditators really is to make that interesting. And the way that we can do that is bring up this, develop this joy and happiness from positive states of mind, like giving, like uh, contentment, happy to be here, that's contentment, and uh, from a loving kindness, uh, from uh, gratitude, thankfulness, many, many different ways we can develop it and then bring it up in the meditation. And I actually encourage people to use it, combine it with a meditation object to make it much more attractive. And then the mind will stay with it. And after a time, when the mind has stayed with it, then the natural process will kick in, that the mind starts to come together. There starts to be this uh, joy and happiness. And then, then the mind will do it by itself. It will stay put. It won't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> Just as we would if we were enjoying ourselves very much. We don't want to go anywhere else. And so the mind will be like that. When it gets this joy and happiness, which it will develop, it can develop once that sequence uh, is underway, once that natural process is underway. So, and maybe just to getting close to the end of the talk, that um, what is st what is it for? Uh, all this stillness, uh, this uh, right stillness, and of course, it's there there to purify the mind, isn't it? First of all, it purifies the mind of the negativity there. We, the classic classic type of negativity is the five hindrances that block meditation. So it purifies the mind of that. And I always remember Aya Kema, one of my teachers, she used to say one moment of, she'd say concentration, <laughs> used to use that word, is one mo moment of purity, purification. She would always say that. So when the mind comes together, those hindrances, those negative qualities of mind, uh, are weakened, reduced, and can be uh, completely abandoned by by wisdom. So it purifies the mind, and it's also good to realize, uh, that, as I said before, that, that we don't need force to do this. Uh, one of the other one of the other aspects of the uh, experience of what's it for is to develop happiness and joy. This is what people are looking for in life. We're looking for meaning, purpose. We want to understand what life is about. And this joy and this happiness is an important ingredient that we uh, are drawn by. So it's, the Buddha often said, you know, that one of the things about a jhana, his experience of jhana, was that it's a pleasant abiding here and now, first thing. You know, so uh, it's not it's not a terrible thing, it's not evil <laughs> to experience joy and happiness because the joy and happiness of the mind, it's not the joy and happiness from eating a good meal, seeing a, a nice video or, or whatever. That sort of joy and happiness is very short-lived and doesn't really sustain us. It's not the food of the heart. Whereas this uh, samadhi, this uh, stillness within, this happiness and joy that comes from it, really sustains the heart. And it's really what the mind is looking for. And of course, the, what's the main purpose of developing a stillness, steadiness? Insight, absolutely. Because it enables us to see more clearly into whatever we're looking at. Because a jhana, samadhi, some, any samadhi really magnifies what we're looking at. We can see it much, much more clearly. So for instance, you know, I mentioned the story of the uh, clump of bamboo. I mean, when Ajahn Brahm was a student, he wasn't a, a monk at that stage, his first meditation retreat, seeing that a clump of bamboo, he could really look at it and see so much in that clump of bamboo. For most of us, we would all we'd see is a label, a bamboo, bamboo, or nice, or not nice, <laughs> beautiful, not beautiful, those sorts of things. And then we move on. 
But as the Mahdi mind can just, like Ajahn Brahm, absolutely entranced by what, see, what he was seeing, looking into it. And this is a very important part of the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the power of Samadhi. This is what it's for, to, to enable us to be able to stay with something. And also very important, Ayakima used to have mentioned this, to have that happiness and joy because when we have happiness and joy, whatever we're seeing, whether it's uh, to our liking or not to our liking, we can have that stability that whatever we see won't rock the mind. It will, we can take it on board because we have that inner stability in ourselves, that inner happiness. We can watch whatever, uh, we can observe whatever is before us. So it's very useful for this giving rise to what the Buddha is talking about, of course, for us to develop wisdom. What do we need? For each of us, we need direct experience, direct knowledge. We have the Buddha's teaching that this is how he experienced it, what he uh, found for himself. And this is very valuable. It's a guideline, isn't it? But what he's pointing to for each of us is direct experience, our own experience, not, not from the book. We see it very clearly for ourselves. And so this is possible. And uh, of course, how does he often uh, phrase that? He phrases it knowing and seeing. So we're like very, very uh, experiential. And this is possible with, with jhana, with the, the, the some samadhi in the mind. I should, should mention too that uh, uh, one time Ajahn Chah was asked, uh, how much samadhi do we need? This is very, very pertinent. And because do we need, do we need to get into jhana and all that sort of thing? And he said, his answer, very wise, he said, enough, <laughs> enough samadhi, that's enough. And of course that's true, you know, you can't argue with that. Whatever degree of samadhi you have and you can use it, can give rise to, uh, maybe it can give rise to insight and happiness insight. Uh, so. Well, this is a, a very practical, pragmatic way of looking at it. So I think uh, now maybe just to end, I won't get on to uh, talking about uh, how does samatha and vipassana relate, um, but just to mention that in, in the Buddhist teaching, usually the, the, the way the Buddha taught is you do meditation, and this is basically samatha, and then after that you reflect, you, you do the inside aspect, and that's vipassana. They're not, two, they're not uh, two different types of meditation in the, the way the Buddha taught it. One is a cause for the other. So there's this stability, if there's a steadiness in the mind, it can give rise to this insight, this understanding of reality as it truly is. So it's a causal relationship that, uh, that uh, is, is in place. And of course, sometimes people contemplate first, they get insight, and then the mind becomes steady. Other people... Uh, first of all, the mind gets steady and then they, and they get insight. But really you need both qualities. It's not an either-or, actually. <laughs> not an either-or. The Buddha never actually taught it was either-or. So, and of course, Ajahn Chah, he used the simile of uh, that uh, 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 Samatha and Vipassana is like, Samatha could be the top of the hand and Vipassana the, the bottom of the hand. We need the whole hand. <laughs> we need the whole hand. We've got two aspects to it. Or like a knife, you know, it's got two sides to it. So uh, this is uh, the important thing. It's not, they're not optional qualities. And as I've often mentioned with the Noble Eightfold Path, it's a total path, total package. So it's not, it's not a matter of maybe I'll do a bit of you know, right view and a bit of this and a bit of that. But no, it's a total package. So it's very useful. And I'll end with a quote from the Buddha. And it's one that uh, Ajahn Brahm likes very much. And uh, Bhante Gunaratana, he uses it all the time in his retreats, the retreats that I've been to. And he says, there is no jhana for one without wisdom. So you need a lot of wisdom to get into jhana. There is no wisdom for one without jhana. So for one who has both jhana and wisdom, they, they are in the presence of nibbana, very close to nibbana. So I think that encourages all of us to develop stillness to whatever degree we can and not and not to, as it were, demand or expect the mind, say, to go into first jhana, second jhana, all these things, but allow the possibility that we could, we could have that on the agenda. If we don't have it on the agenda, maybe it will never happen <laughs> because we're not aiming at it. But it's always good to have it and to see the Buddha's own example of it, isn't it? 
and it is uh, something that's very important for the path. It's not a, an optional extra. And then to also to see that it's only uh, samadhi is like sati. This is mindfulness, which most people are aware of. And the Buddha said we cannot have too much mindfulness. It's as an aspect of mindfulness that becomes very steady, very still, very focused, uh, which becomes what we call sama, uh, samadhi, right stillness. So I'd like to finish there, and um, I think, uh, do we, maybe one question, if there's any questions. I never have questions, but we have never enough time, just one, I think. Mante, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, oh, th my question you. is you, that... Um, yeah. We do get into peaceful states when we go to retreats and so forth, but uh, how do we actually put it into our daily life, uh, um, you know, to lose our sense of self, which we, which we can't really in daily life because we are somebody or going to work or somebody's mother or somebody's wife or mm. husband or what. So what, what practical suggestions do you give to, to, to practice in our daily life? Ah, oh, right. Uh, what is, uh, yes, yes. And of course, the, the, main, the main thing to practice in daily life for, in terms of samadhi, the developing samadhi, is of course mindfulness. If we keep the mindfulness continuous, when we, if, if, the, if that's possible for, for most people, it's, it's a, what we aim at, making the mindfulness continuous 24-7 as much as possible. A very enjoyable state, a very pleasant state. And then when we sit down to meditate, then the mind will very naturally get more and more still, more and more peaceful, and may enter the jhanas. very useful thing with the jhanas in terms of our everyday life is having experienced some sense of stillness, a peace, of inner joy and happiness, we can remember it, we remember it, don't we? And that is a very, very useful memory to have. We know we've been there. And it's a, like a refuge for you. When things are not easy, when things are difficult, we have that refuge, we remember, that peace, that stillness, that joy within. And we know that it's within us, it's not out there in the world. And that's a very important lesson. So it's, it's something we can remember and we can use mindfulness to, to as it were, keep the <laughs> Keep the pot boiling, <laughs> keep the pot on the boil by keeping the uh, causal condition for samadhi there. So thank you for that question. And I think it's time that we, we finish and pay respects, if you wish to, to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. And then you're welcome to have a shared meal at 11 o'clock next door. Thank you very much. Sir.